Nashville, Tennessee is a powerhouse. Culturally, economically, politically, it is truly one of the great cities of the southern United States. The volunteer state's anchor and most populated city, it's one of the fastest growing metropolitan areas in the United States, and is renowned globally for its music scene, earning the city its popular music city moniker. On any average day, the city's streets are brimming with life as tourists and locals alike frequent the many businesses, bars, and restaurants the downtown has to offer. On one spring day in 1998, however, the city's streets came to a standstill. People in skyscrapers looked down upon the city below as debris flew around and dark sheets of rain and thick, murky clouds overtook the skyline. Those caught outside or in the direct path of the storm soon found themselves surrounded by swirling winds clocking in at over 100 miles per hour, as a large F3 tornado barreled right through the city of 700,000 people. This twister, as devastating as it would prove to be, was just the beginning. Over the course of the next few hours, several violent tornadoes would terrorize the South, and Tennessee in particular, killing 12 and causing hundreds of millions of dollars in damage. Of these subsequent tornadoes, one would prove to stand above the rest, both in strength and in impact. The Lawrenceburg F5, which would terrorize portions of rural southern Tennessee, but proved to be forgotten and overlooked amidst the carnage in the state's capital. This is the story of the 1998 Nashville tornado outbreak. From the historic forgotten F5 to the infamous Nashville twister, the damage it caused, the people it impacted, and the lives it changed forever. Let's start from the beginning. The day prior to these events, April 15th, had been extremely active tornado-wise in its own right, with the Storm Prediction Center issuing a high risk for portions of the Middle Mississippi Valley centered on Arkansas. 21 tornadoes would touch down across five states, including an F4 that would terrorize portions of the rural community of Manila, Arkansas, shortly after midnight in the early morning hours of the 16th. This twister would tragically take the lives of two individuals, an unfortunate sign of what was to come. On the morning of April 16, 1998, many Tennessee residents awoke to the sounds of thunder and rain as this decaying system of storms would progress through the state. Some individuals in the western part of Tennessee would see a few tornadoes associated with these early morning storms, but the occasional gusty winds and hailstones were the primary hazards residents had to deal with as they went off to work on what was by and large just an ordinary Tuesday morning. Shortly before noon, the sun had begun to shine across the region as the morning storms moved further to the east. With the added heat from the sun, the air would soon begin to grow unstable. Dew points would rise as the moisture left over from that morning storms would fester in the springtime air, setting the atmosphere up for a dangerous day ahead. By early afternoon, Cape values had risen well over 1,000 joules per kilogram and were still rising. Winds high up in the atmosphere that would aid in the initiation of storms would prove to be rather strong as well. As more and more information supporting the potential for a significant tornado outbreak would flood in, the Storm Prediction Center would make the decision to issue the second high risk in two days for much of Dixie Alley, including almost the entire state of Tennessee. Quickly, local officials and meteorologists would get to work, dispersing information to locals who now found themselves in harm's way. For hours on end, weathermen on TV and employees at the National Weather Service across the state would watch in worrisome anticipation as storms would begin to fire in the early afternoon. These storms would quickly blossom into large supercells, which would take full advantage of the favorable conditions in place, wasting no time growing to be tens of thousands of feet in height. As the clock approached 3 in the afternoon, one supercell in particular tracking through Middle Tennessee would catch the eyes of weather forecasters. This storm not only caught their eyes because of the rapidly intensifying nature it exhibited on radar, but also because of where it was heading, right towards Tennessee's largest city and capital, Nashville. At 3.30pm, a tornado that would go on to become the infamous Nashville F3 would touch down associated with this storm near I-440 in West Nashville. 
The tornado would take on a multi-vortex look, as several smaller funnels would rotate throughout the main circulation. The twister would quickly grow in width as it moved to the west, heavily shrouded in rain as it tore through the residential neighborhoods of Sylvan Heights and Midtown, narrowly missing the campus of Vanderbilt University. The tornado's first and only fatality would occur here, at Nashville Centennial Park. Unfortunately, one Vanderbilt University ROTC cadet was pinned down by a tree and eventually succumbed to his injuries here. As the tornado moved into downtown Nashville, sky cams would capture the twister as it moved closer and closer to the skyline, depicting a large, eerie mess of rain and clouds progressing slowly towards the city center. Thousands of people in downtown skyscrapers and on the ground would be left helpless as strong, howling winds descended into the city streets, whipping glass and other debris around in a wild whirlwind left to the mercy of the storm. The twister would significantly damage countless office buildings and several of the city's iconic skyscrapers, busting out hundreds of windows and leaving several buildings structurally unsound. In fact, in the wake of the tornado, 35 buildings in downtown would be red-tagged and were later forced to be demolished or significantly refurbished. The nation's bank office tower would be one of the hardest hit in the city, losing almost all of its windows. The Tennessee Performance Arts Center would also have well over 100 windows busted out, alongside significant roof damage and wall damage. Several news stations based in downtown Nashville would also suffer direct hits while covering the twister, leading to several of these stations going off air temporarily as the tornado struck them. Cameramen and other employees would keep the cameras running, however, racing outside to film the approaching twister even as it struck their stations. After passing downtown, the tornado would subsequently proceed to cross the Cumberland River, striking the construction site for what was then to be the new stadium for the Tennessee Oilers. Three cranes at the construction site would be knocked down by the tornado's strong winds, though only minor damage would occur to the construction site itself. Following this, the twister would progress into East Nashville, a predominantly residential neighborhood. 
Home after home in this area would see significant roof and structural damage as street signs and power lines would fall down left and right. After moving through the neighborhood, the Cornelia Fort Airport would suffer a direct hit from the tornado, which by this point was at peak intensity, with winds of nearly 160 miles per hour. Thirty planes at the airport would suffer varying degrees of damage. After crossing the Cumberland River for a second time, the F-3 tornado would enter the city of Hermitage. The historic Hermitage estate, the longtime personal resident of American President Andrew Jackson, would be hit head-on by the storm. Thousands of trees on the property would be toppled, some of which were said to have been planted by Jackson himself. Though all major properties, including the mansion that you can see here, on the estate would escape the storm without significant damage. After moving through the city of Mount Juliet, where a baseball field and a lumber yard would suffer significant damage, the twister would begin to gradually weaken, moving into portions of rural Wilson County before lifting near Lebanon. In its wake, the tornado would leave a damage path roughly 28 miles long. 60 people would suffer varying degrees of injuries, and one fatality would occur. The twister would cause over $100 million in damage, making it at the time one of the costliest in U.S. history. Instantly, national media would descend upon the city as news of the disaster would begin to spread around the country. But the outbreak wasn't over yet. Even as most of the focus would remain on the damage in Nashville, another supercell further to the south near the Alabama border would explode as the sun began to set across the Tennessee Valley. As the storm would approach the town of Lawrenceburg, Doppler radar in the area would detect rapidly increasing rotation within the cell, associated with a well-defined hook echo, both indicative of tornado activity. Shortly after 4 p.m., storm spotters would confirm that a large wedge tornado had touched down and just moving rapidly to the northeast. Within mere minutes, the tornado would begin producing violent damage, mowing down thousands of trees as it moved through predominantly rural areas of the state. While the twister would thankfully avoid urban areas, it would strike several large, well-built homes as it moved through the Wayne and Lawrence County areas. Most of these homes would unfortunately suffer catastrophic damage. Some of these structures would be flattened, a few being swept clean off of their foundations. Many of these homes even had anchor bolts. Most vehicles that would be caught in the Twister's fury would be tossed hundreds of yards away and mangled beyond recognition. NWS damage surveyors would also note that large clumps of dirt had been torn out of the ground near the center of the Twister's windfield, and that dozens of trees had been debarked, a few completely, something seen in only the most violent of tornadoes. The twister would thankfully kill no one, thanks to the ample warning provided by National Weather Service forecasters and the rural nature of the area impacted by the twister. However, large amounts of livestock owned by farmers in Wayne and Lawrence counties wouldn't be so lucky, perishing in the storm. The Lawrence County tornado was the first F5 in Tennessee since the 1923 Pinson Twister, and proved devastating to the local economy. The twister would cause over $4 million in damages, and would lead to even greater losses for those impacted due to the long-term damage it dealt to local farms. After roughly an hour, the tornado would end its reign of terror, leaving behind an apocalyptic damage path 19 miles long, right through the heart of southern Tennessee. blank right here.
The Lawrenceburg tornado's path has been confirmed to have been 19 miles long, though it was originally thought that the tornado had been on the ground for much longer. The tornado's path originally ran all the way from Hardin County to Maury County in Tennessee, though this was revised in a 2013 reanalysis to the current path length. The other segments of the path were broken up into two additional tornadoes, both of which were still devastating in their own right, earning F4 ratings. In the immediate aftermath of the Twisters, most of the aid and attention would go to Nashville, leaving those impacted by the Lawrenceburg tornado and the other Twisters that occurred that day without much assistance. Though all of the areas would, in time, rebuild and recover, for many in Tennessee and the nation, the Lawrence County Twister would fade out of memory, leaving the tornado to earn its moniker of the Forgotten F5. The outbreak would continue into the late night hours, persisting all the way into the Smoky Mountains before finally dissipating. All in all, 12 people were killed by the tornadoes, over 100 people were suffered varying degrees of injuries, and over $133 million in damages would be recorded. It was the worst outbreak to hit Tennessee in years. The Nashville Twister was the first EF2 plus tornado to hit the downtown of a major metropolitan area with 100,000 plus people in nearly 20 years, and was a reminder to many that strong tornadoes can indeed strike big cities. Lawrenceburg and surrounding areas were changed forever, the scars of the tornado remaining to this day in the form of forests and farmsteads now reduced to nothing. As the sun set upon the volunteer state, those impacted by the Twisters knew that April 16, 1998 was going to be a day they were never going to forget, and one that they hoped would never repeat itself. Unfortunately for them, Mother Nature has a funny way of repeating history. Just over 20 years later, on March 3, 2020, another large, high-end EF3 would tear through downtown Nashville, killing five people and causing over $1.5 billion in damage in the process. We won't go into too much detail about this outbreak today, and that deserves its own video, but the similarities between the 1998 outbreak and the tornadoes of March 3, 2020 don't stop there. Like April 16th, another stronger tornado also occurred on the same night as the Nashville Twister. The city of Cookville, about 80 miles east of Nashville, took a direct hit from a wedge EF4 tornado in the middle of the night. But, like the Lawrenceburg F5 in 1998, it was seemingly forgotten by most in the media, the attention and subsequent aid to victims going largely to the state's capital. Nashville today is just as beautiful, lively, and bustling as ever. Despite everything the city has had thrown at it, its residents have remained strong and resilient, building back better than ever every single time. A testament to the strength and willpower of human beings, we can all take a little something out of their story. From Nashville, this has been Overcast. Thank you for watching.